are back on the Zero Hour. I'm your host, Richard R.J. Escal. We all know there's a health care crisis in this country. If you don't know it before you get sick, chances are you will once you get sick. And here to talk about that with us now as a guest, I always look forward to speaking with Lynn Paramore as an author and cultural critic. Uh, her recent piece was published at inateconomics.org and at, that's the Institute for New Economic Thinking, and at Common Dreams under the headline, United States of Death, question mark, study shows worrying mortality rates of broken health care system. It was published on August 15th. We've had uh, no good news since then, that's for sure. So first of all, Lynn Paramore, uh, welcome back to the program. Thank you so much for having me, Richard. Pleasure to be here. It is a pleasure to have you, not a necessarily a pleasure to talk about uh, this new report, Jacob Bohr, Professor of Global Health and Ep Epidemiology, uh, his report, um, tell us about it a little bit. Yes, well, you know, this surprised me. Like you and probably all of your viewers, we know there's a healthcare crisis. We've heard that Americans are living shorter lives, that we're more depressed, we're more likely to skip treatment than other countries. But um, even I didn't realize just how stark the problem actually is, nor did the researchers that uh, recently published a study uh, highlighting how bad it's become. They were surprised. Jacob Bohr of Boston University and his colleagues uh, did a study which they titled Missing Americans, uh, and they studied American mortality rates from 1933 to 2021. Now, why did they name the story, uh, the study, Missing Americans? Uh, that's because as they frame what's happened, which I think is a very interesting way of framing it, um, they talk about the Americans that are not with us uh, because we have not kept up with other peer countries in terms of our mortality. Uh, they looked at uh, several different countries, 16 Western European countries, I believe it was, plus Canada, plus Japan. So uh, I think that's 18 countries in all. And the, um, the American mortality rates were abysmal in comparison. And it really, it jived with a study that was done by the Commonwealth Fund in 2021, which showed American health outcomes last out of 11 countries. Um, and what was really interesting about their work is that they found, because they started back in 1933, that actually America began in relationship to those other countries as a front runner. We did much better. Um, and that advantage lasted all the way until the 1970s, which is when things started to change. 1980 is the year that they really mark when Americans uh, started dying more than peer countries and also dying younger. Uh, that was a, a, a factor that they really honed in on in the study, that we die younger than uh, than people in our peer countries. So it, it was a, a, a very sobering piece of research. And uh, the title of the piece of the study is Missing Americans Early Death in the United States. Uh, and of course, now, I think since you wrote this article, since the study came out, we have yet more confirmation that uh, life expectancy has fallen once again in the United States. That in fact, which means of course, that the uh, figures are even worse than Professor Bohr uh, saw because 2021 was uh, a year, of course, we had COVID in 2020 and 2021, but where other companies, uh, excuse me, where other countries, re re we are kind of a national corporation at this point, but where other countries rebounded from uh, COVID more quickly, uh, we lagged behind once again. Isn't that right? Yes. Um, it's, it's interesting because, um, well, they, they describe what they call excess deaths. So they noted in 2019, the United States had about 650,000 excess deaths compared to other countries, meaning people, again, that wouldn't have died if we had kept up with the mortality rates in these peer countries. But they... Uh, 
Jacob Bohr noted to me in a discussion I had with him that actually in 2021, that number of, of excess deaths swelled to over 1 million. And just to put that in context, um, I was looking up the city populations for the largest cities in the United States. Now, these are city populations that don't include the metro areas. So, you know, that's a caveat. But um, a, a million excess deaths in one year alone, 2021, is more than the population, the city population of Atlanta and Miami combined. It's just an astonishing number of people. And these are real human beings. There are neighbors, there are colleagues, you know, there are people who had families, there are people who had contributions to make, they're uh, people we loved and they're not with us and they're not going to be with us. And another way that, um, that Bohr and his colleagues really helped bring the tragedy uh, to life for me and I think a lot of people who've looked at this study is they tabulated based on the year, um, how old people were when they died and, all, and how long they could have been expected to live if America was keeping up on mortality rates with the peer countries. And they found that in the year 2021, we lost 25 million years of life. In one year, we lost 25 million years of life. It just makes the hair on the back of my neck right. stand up to think about that. It's, it's profoundly upsetting. It is, and it, it it's also, by the way, that's my go-to move when I write about healthcare, too, is to say that's more than the population of X and Y and Z. And, you know, what I always think about at times like that is there was something else we were doing wrong as a country. And let's say it did manifest that way. Oh, we just lost Atlanta or whatever. Uh, that would get people's attention. You know, 3,000 deaths on... Um, on September 11th, we changed everything, but a million deaths, we do nothing uh, substantially different. We, you know, we make certain efforts here and there, uh, but the fact is, you know, for example, even COVID, we have, uh, I think it's down below 500 now, but at least once a week, we experience the equivalent of another 9-11 from COVID alone. Yeah. So it somehow seems as if, uh, you know, you're a cultural historian, among other things. And it just seems to me, before we continue with this uh, report, it seems to me that there's a, a social pathology at work here, where we we literally have people dying all around us and we don't see them. We don't process them emotionally. We don't mourn them as a nation and we don't do anything to save them. Yes, I think that that's true. And that's that's why I share your urge in writing to try to make these things concrete, to get us out of the ab abstract realm of statistics. Uh, but I think you're right. We don't see these deaths somehow. And I think part of it has to to do with what um, a colleague, Peter Temin, uh, the late Peter Temin, who had been um, an economist at MIT, describes in his book, The Vanishing Middle Class. And he talked about how the United States in the last couple of decades has diverged into two separate economies. He puts it as 70% and 30%. Some might say it's 80-20. You could argue about the exact, you know, uh, ratio. But it's essentially, he's drawing attention to the fact that people in the United States live in entirely different legal frameworks. They live in mm -hmm. different neighborhoods. They travel in different ways. They have different educational systems and they have different health care systems, notably. Um, if you have a college degree and you have a stable job, you're in that 30%. But the majority of Americans do not have that kind of stability. They cannot be deal with a health emergency. They can't pay for it. Um, they don't have regular access to a primary care doctor. Uh, and we've really seen that, that play out during the COVID crisis, how lacking we've been in public infrastructure to deal with this emergency. Our, our COVID response has been pretty abysmal on the world stage. Um, it doesn't really seem to be getting much better. We're almost pretending that workers are not at risk when they go back to work. Companies are dropping mandates for masks and so on. And, you know, it's, of course, in the United States, because we have structural racism as a legacy, 
it's black people, it's Native Americans, uh, and it's also women who bear the brunt of this. And you're right, the, you know, the two worlds that Peter Timmon describes, you might describe them as the haves and have nots, they they don't interact as much as they used to. They don't share the same schools. They don't, you know, uh, go to the same places for vacation. They don't interact. They don't know each other. So a lot of doctors, interestingly, are not aware of this information because they don't see the people that are dying at, at, um, at such a, a, a clip. And, you know, it's interesting uh, that uh, two events that really, uh, at least briefly, tore a little hole in that veil between the different worlds, I think, were one was the WPA under Franklin D. Roosevelt. I've read history of it, of it where people say, you know, I never met a poor white person from the south or a black person from the city or from the south i never met a jew or an italian or you know whatever until i joined the wpa and of course the other at least for uh men was uh the second world war and uh, while i don't recommend war as a you know as a social form of social cohesion it do it does bring together people it seems as if nowadays you know we've had an elective uh, military service for the last, what, 40, 50 years. We've had, uh, I was in the last generation that had to, you know, f deal with the draft. And um, we, it seems as if now we're drifting apart into utterly separate worlds. And it seems to me that our ability to elicit compassion towards one another has gone with it. Yes. It's, um, the sociologist Arlie Hochschild, whose work I just love, refers to the empathy gap and climbing the empathy wall that we have to we have to see people to care about them um, and and to understand that uh, you know their loss is our loss and to see ourselves in this connective web. I mean, it's it this kind of atomization. You and I have discussed this many times. Is a mindset. Uh, that is really bolstered by capitalism, unbridled capitalism, free market ideology. You know, we're we're supposed to act in our economic personal self-interest, and that's supposed to be our goal in life. And that's, of course, not what really drives human beings, but that's what we've been conditioned. Uh, that's the stance we've been conditioned to take. And again, this some of the things that happened during the pandemic that were so that brought this so starkly to life. I remember the lieutenant governor of Texas, uh, Duvall, I believe is the name, Patrick Duvall, said that, uh, well, you know, people, uh, workers may get COVID and they may die, but there are things more important than life. Right. So he was specifically talking about older people. He said, uh, I think he said he was 70 or, or thereabouts. And he said, you know, people over, you know, people who've lived a long time, uh should be prepared to sacrifice something like for the sake of the economy and you know my of course my answer was speak for yourself old man but you know it's like <laughs> and not me but good, knock yourself out but um and you also point out that uh by the way that uh, while we're talking about age, that the co coronavirus is supposed to prey, you know, most viciously on the elderly, but that in America, people still considered to be in their working years, okay. since, of course, many older people must work now, too, uh, have been dropping away at higher That's rates. Right. That's right. And, and of course, then you ask the question, why is this? And the researchers, uh, you know, didn't want to speak definitively upon this because there there is a lot more investigation to be done. But some of the the matters that they brought up, which I've heard echoed, and I'm sure you've heard echoed um, among others who've looked at this problem, the United States is an outlier in gun violence, of course. Uh, so we have people dying at higher rates from gun violence. Uh, we have the opioid crisis, which has been right. really severe and taken a lot of people before their time. We have a problem with obesity, uh, more of a problem than many of our peer countries, which leads to all kinds of issues like diabetes and heart disease. Um, we have free market ideology that we were just discussing and money-driven politics, which turns politicians away from 
public-minded policies that would support the health and welfare of the population. So those are some of the things that uh, that give us an you know an unpleasant distinction. By the same token, you know, as I mentioned, the, the researchers found that we were a front runner in mortality rates from 1933 until the 70s. Now, part of that early on was driven by the war, by World War II. So we didn't lose as many people. And then, of course, you had in Japan and Western Europe, there was a lot of chaos and destruction that probably made mortality rates, um, uh, impacted mortality rates there for about 10 years after the war. So we did have an advantage there, but it wasn't just that. Um, we did invest, we had, uh, we invested in the middle class. We had the GI Bill. We promoted home ownership, you know, with the caveat that white Americans were the ones who predominantly benefited from that. We had President Johnson's war on poverty. We had the expansion of, um, of Medicare and Medicaid. And we also had, um, as Bohr mentioned, the racial integration of hospitals. In 1963, that helped us and helped mitigate some of the impact of the structural racism. Uh, so we were doing some things right. The strength of our organized labor, another factor right, which led to higher wages. Social security coming in around that time, greatly reducing elder mortality. Absolutely. Uh, so we, we know how to do things well. We know how to do things right. But again, you know, that, that year 1980, of course, the name Ronald Reagan pops into everyone's mind. <laughs> um, and he did have something to do with this turn for the worse. Um Although, as Bohr mentions, it's much, much more complicated than one person's presidency. But um, we began to diverge from our peers, and the trend really seems to have accelerated in the 21st century. It's getting, um, it's speeding up. It's getting worse and worse. And in the wake of this, of course, what the Supreme Court has been doing, for example, uh, with en en environmental regulation, uh, the abortion story fits into this in a very profoundly disturbing way. You're going to make things harder for women. Sure. You're make their health their their health care more difficult. You're going to put them at risk, um, even of mortality <laughs> in childbirth. Um, and their children, of course, are going to suffer. There's more impoverishment um, among existing children. So we're doing a lot of things to accelerate and exacerbate this trend. And that is what I really find most profoundly disturbing. Well, I think that's exactly right. And, and you know, I think though, certainly most of the people who listen to this show uh, would consider themselves on the right side of this issue. And I would, you know, think they were too, Lynn Paramore. But uh, uh, part of what concerns me is that, uh, you know, the Democratic Party has largely become the party of the professional and managerial class and to that extent while people may want to want to do the right thing um they may for example see major overhaul of our health care system is unnecessary because they literally going back to peter temin and his work they literally don't see that other america where that 70 percent where people white and black male and female are struggling to survive and they may not see uh they may be concerned about racial disparities in health care but less aware that the mechanism of racial disparities in health care is usually the mechanism of unequal poverty or you know unequal economic inequality addressing minority populations so i feel as if it's more important than ever not just to push back on Republicans, but for everybody who's not in that struggling 70% to become a little more empathic about uh, the lives that are being lost. Absolutely. Um, you know, o overcoming this empathy wall is a major part of our task. And, you know, it's... Um, our presence, our, our, our ability to lead on the world stage is also part of this story. Um, the, the intensely disturbing idea that we spend more on uh, health care per capita than any of these other countries, and we still have these negative health outcomes, it's, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're not a front runner anymore. We're, we're, we're lagging behind. 
and we um it's not the kind of american exceptionalism we were taught to no. be of it's um it's it's very very disturbing and i think that you know as we you know you and i were discussing a little bit before we came on as we go into labor day weekend you know look at jackson mississippi there are people who who can't get clean water there. They can't even get water to flush their toilets, whether they're black or white. Um, and that does have something to do with climate change. And it does has, have something to, to do with, you know, these forgotten parts of the country that people, you know, maybe in Los Angeles or New York aren't thinking about. But these problems are, be are going to become more common. You know, that 30% and 70% divide uh, may well turn into 80% and 25% percent 85 percent and 15 percent you know the middle right. class is is shrinking and there are more of us that are going to occupy that second america which is more like a developing country than it is you know a so-called first world country uh some of us don't have citizenship there yet but our our citizenship card is in the mail it's coming right. as we get older as we become sick and we can't get appropriate care um we're, many of us are sliding down the economic ladder and sliding into places where these problems are going to be um, become all too real to us. You know, the economist who I've written about, um, not favorably, uh, one would say, but uh, Tyler Cohen, C-O-W-E-N, Tyler Cohen, has written a lot about how, now he says he's not advocating this, but that we're going to live in an 85-15 country where 15% of the people thrive in the new uh, technological economy, 85% are just uh, taking up, basically taking up space. And, you know, he makes the appropriate sounds about bemoaning this, but saying we should be preparing for that. You know, what I've heard of private conversations among very top, Silicon Valley billionaires and the like uh, is that that's what they expect and that part of their logic for, you know, addictive social media is and, and part of their logic, by the way, for supporting a very minimal universal basic income uh, is to keep the 85 percent tranquilized and uh, perhaps addicted uh, to, um, you know, medications as well and uh, and in survival mode, just well, enough to live on, because they think that's, they're expecting a kind of neo techno feudalistic society, and people are going to get sick, people are going to die, they're not going to live very long, uh, except for the lucky few who can show they're above average in something, as Tyler Cowen writes, average is over, which is mathematically implausible, but, you know, ideologically terrifying, and I guess this is just my way of saying, if we talk about you know the the Bohr study. If we talk about everything you're writing about so well here, Lynn Paramore, we're also talking about, a, in my mind, in in one hand, a lack of empathy from people who would not want the world to be this way, but on the other hand, a very powerful ideology from very powerful people saying this is all fine. Or or. Or even if they think it's not fine, it's inevitable. This is just the way it is. This is the way the cookie crumbles get used to it. And that has been a, a view very prevalent among mainstream economists. You know, you hear things about the natural rate of unemployment as if these were natural laws and, and things like right. physics that, you know, we really can't change or do anything about or it would be destructive for us to try to intervene. Um, I think that's all a bunch of BS, quite frankly. Uh, these conditions that we talked about, uh, the conditions connected to organized labor, connected to the expansion of programs like Social Security and Medicare. You know, these are all conscious decisions that have been made on the part of the public and, and policymakers to change things in a positive direction that gives more people a chance for a fulfilling life and strengthens the whole economy, by the way. The entire economy is strengthened when we have a, 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 a healthy, well cared for population. So I just, I don't feel like resignation is the answer or adaptation to conditions that we view as inevitable. Um, I'm more interested in transformation because I know that we can do it. We've, we have a track record that shows this, that 
shows that we we can have both a healthy population and a healthy economy at the same time. We can, you know, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. So I'm not a big fan of Tyler Cohen's um, perspective, and I think it's defeatist. And frankly, I think it it helps lead to the kind of mindset where people begin to turn to authoritarianism because they don't believe that anybody cares about solving their problems. And, you know, when you hear that kind of rhetoric coming from experts, how, why would you not just throw up your hands and say, well, let's, let's turn to somebody else. Let's, right. These experts aren't helping me. So let me go to a demagogue who's at least speaking a language that connects to, to my heart. Well, absolutely. You know, I, there was a study, I don't know if you saw it, Lynn, of, uh, I, I've alluded to it a couple of times. I think it was done in 2019 uh, in the U.S. and several other developed countries that basically said that 40% or so of the population would was willingly spreading false stories because... I think the authors use the term because they want to burn down the democratic cosmos because they just think the whole system sucks and they know that what they're saying is wrong. They don't care. Uh, you know, and part of me honestly says, I want to burn it down too. I don't, you know, if all the experts tell me that everybody I grew up with and people like them are, are human, you know, refuse, then you know what? get me a new elite you know then i uh, screw the elites let's let's get a system uh, uh you, you guys call yourself experts maybe we should let the non-experts take you get what i'm saying it's, it yeah, brings out a kind of a, a, anarchic feeling you know right yeah i mean you know steve bannon not one of my favorite people but he did uh utter something that i i thought was absolutely true you know he said that if it hadn't been for the way the tarp the bailout happened in the wake of the great financial crisis with banks being bailed out and ordinary people kind of left <laughs> on their own, uh, we wouldn't have had the Tea Party, we wouldn't have had all the things that led up to Donald Trump. So when we forget about ordinary people and we act as if they don't matter, as if their very lives don't matter, um, as we've seen people you know, behaving during COVID, um, yeah, a, a, a history shows that a, a turn to authoritarianism is certainly one of the paths uh, that that we're likely to take. And that's not going to make people like Tyler Cohen very happy, I don't think. Well, I'm not here to make Tyler Cohen happy. If I were, I wouldn't have written <laughs> about him. The um, By the way, he's also completely wrong about music. <laughs> he knows a lot about music, but he claims that my favorite country singing duo, the Leuven Brothers, were bluegrass, which is absolutely false. Oh, the Leuven really? Brothers. Okay, that's yeah. one I can't offer an opinion on. I'll have to look. Over. Well, if you love the Leuven Brothers as much as I do, you know that bluegrass came later yeah. or at, on along a parallel I do, track. I do love bluegrass. You know, I grew up in North Carolina and I spent the summers going to the mountains. And so, so we got a little taste of bluegrass up there. Um, another great, a, a great cultural product of ordinary Americans and uh, didn't come from the privileged elite. It came from ordinary working class people. I used to be able to go into a VFW hall anywhere in West Virginia with a guitar and there'd be somebody playing bluegrass. I don't know if that's, I doubt that's true anymore. Uh, more homogenization at the top. But you know, uh, Lynn, before I let you go, I know that uh, you also talked about uh, the impact of capitalism on life expect expectancy, Thomas Ferguson's et, et al.'s work on how uh, uh, you know, private equity donations and others undermine democracy. But you know me, I hate to end on a down note. Yeah. Uh, I, I, you know, let them do that. Let them try to induce despair, right? Yeah. I mean, uh we're losing lives right and left it's it's urgent it's uh you know i mean it, it's tantamount to uh, morally tantamount to murder in some cases i think but but uh what do you do you see anything hopeful in the future or anything that could be hopeful if people double down on it well i you know as i said we can do better we know that we can do better and that we have it in, in us because we have and we have programs like social security and medicare care that are de demonstrably helpful to this problem so we can expand them. Um, I think that transformation 
is possible. Uh, we are not just robots and we don't have to accept what our politicians are telling us. And, you know, there are little, little hopeful signs. I mean, the Inflation Reduction Act, for example, while I'm not a fan of, of, it, of everything in it, maybe there are a few little things in there that we can build on uh, for a healthier future. Um, but I think that, you know, your program is so important for the awareness. And, you know, we, we didn't even get into private equity or some of the forces that are bearing down on us in a very negative way. But I think, you know, private equity exists because we allow it to exist. It doesn't have to exist. We can say no. Right. To, we can say no to all these things. They're not forces of nature. They're not inevitable. Um, they're things that we decide whether or not we're going to accept. Well, I think that's exactly right. And obviously, of course, national health care, real national health care should figure into this yeah. somehow. I mean, there are a million dimensions to this. And I also think, you know, the uh, the cultural uh, awareness is really important. That's why I think, you know, what you're doing is so important. Uh, you close, by the way, with Professor Bohr saying um, what you see is exactly the opposite. What he finds frustrating is that you'd expect in a democracy the political system would respond when there's a major health crisis and people's material realities are in dis decline, what you see is exactly the opposite. Then he says, it seems very bleak, but you think, gosh, there has to be an opportunity for a new politics here. Yes. Well, you think? Yes, absolutely. I mean, when you have an economy and a, and a culture which doesn't support life, Yes, you can be you can be sure it's time for something fundamental to change, not not a time for little tweaks. It's time for transformation. Right. Well, thank you for writing this article again. The article is at least as headlined in uh, Common Dreams is United States of Death study shows worrying mortality rates of broken health system. And of course, it's actually so much more than just a broken health system. It's a broken econ economic system. Uh, so Lynn Paramore, author and cultural uh, historian. Is that the right term, cultural historian, or should I use something else? That's fine. Some people say cultural critic. Either one is fine. I love to okay. talk about history, so I, 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 I guess I prefer the historian title. <laughs> okay. Well, um, so thanks for all your great work. Thanks for writing this. And as always, great talking to you. And thanks for coming on the program. Wonderful talking to you, too. Take good care. You, too. And we'll be right back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Escow, and this is The Zero Hour. <laughs>